My name is Joe Dalton, entrepreneur and business coach. Welcome to Breakthrough Brands. Each week, we bring you an inspirational story and an insight to the minds of some of the top business leaders, authors, and mentors from around the globe. Whatever is needed to make you shine in life and business, you'll find it here. On today's show, we have Dr. Srini Pillay. Dr. Srini is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, brain imaging researcher, and leadership development expert. He works with nonprofits and Fortune 500 companies globally to help leaders understand how to change brain blood flow to manage risk, uncertainty, and volatility, and to also harness creativity. He is the author of Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try, Unlock the Power of the Unfocused Mind. He is an in-demand keynote speaker and widely sought after by the media. He's been featured on CNN, Fox TV, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, Forbes, Fortune and Oprah Radio. Hello folks and welcome to today's show, Breakthrough Brands. And I have a very special guest on today, Serini Perret. Have I got the name correct? Uh, it's Serini Pillay. Pillay. P-I-L-L-A-Y. Perfect. And this gentleman is well established uh, around the world and he's just published a new book, Unlock the Power of Your Unfocused Mind. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. I'm delighted. So tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself before we get into the book. Where did it all start for yourself? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where to start, but I was born in South Africa, uh, went to medical school there and then... Um, after medical school, decided that I wanted to do a year of neurochemistry research, did that, uh, and then did my residency at Harvard in Boston, became a psychiatrist, uh, then did about 17 years of studying the brain, and so became a brain imaging researcher, after which I decided that I wanted to apply this this information uh, across different fields. And uh, having had, I also directed the anxiety disorders clinic um, at Harvard, at McLean Hospital, uh, and I continued my clinical practice. So I thought a nice thing to do would be to connect human behavior with some of the brain findings and then find a very different field in which I could apply that. So I became a certified master executive coach uh, and then started working with leaders within Fortune 500 companies, helping them uh, try to figure out how to manage their anxiety and stress and volatility and enhance their creativity and innovation by drawing on the research of brain science to help them do this. So that's one of the sort of trajectories in my life right now. And I'm, I'm currently also uh, have founded a couple of technology companies that have to do with embedding learning within companies so that after we teach it, they can keep it online. Um, and then also looking at some augmented reality and virtual reality paradigms as well. And in addition to that, I work in biotechnology where I work with investment companies, helping them understand which drugs uh, across the spectrum of medicine might be approved or not. Um, and I'm a musician currently writing a musical. So I'm doing a lot of different things uh, currently. There's a, there's, I, can, I can hear another book there somewhere. Do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> least, at least on, on, your, on your deathbed, you, when people ask you, do you know, do you feel that you've achieved anything in life? You're one of those people that say, yes, I have. I've left a legacy. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure that I would say that, but I certainly am doing a lot, you know, in the sense that I think one of the things that happens when you immerse yourself deeply in a number of fields and then work across a number of fields is that the more you learn, the more you're aware uh, of stuff you do not know. Yeah. And so I feel most of what I do when I work with leaders within organizations or entrepreneurs or even my patients, I think the more I learn, the more I feel I don't know. And so life becomes much more of an exploration and a discovery. And I would say that's the most exciting part of, of, uh, of that, of that whole sort of, uh, trip through life, that journey through life. Tell me in your book, you talk about focus. Explain to me, or explain, explain to the audience out there that it's very good not to focus and why they should do it. Sure. So first of all, I'm very much in favor of focus from time to time. And so I think that being able to focus is what will allow us to get through tasks and to get them executed. But there are a couple of disadvantages of focus that I think we should be aware of. And as a result of that, we should also build unfocus into our days. 
So with regard to the disadvantages of focus, um, here are a few. Firstly, focus drains your brain of energy. So if you spend your entire day just going focus, 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 by the end of the day, your brain is not going to have enough energy to do what it needs to do. And in fact, frequently by midday or even by lunchtime, a lot of people don't have the energy to work effectively. So there was a study, for example, that took two groups of people, asked them to watch a video, and one group of people had to watch it with intense focus, and the other group had to watch it as usual. And after that, both groups were asked to solve a moral dilemma. Well, what the study investigators found was that the people who focused intensely couldn't care less. They just, they just had no energy to care. But when you actually gave them glucose, they started to care again, whereas the group that didn't focus too intensely cared about the problem. And what this tells us is that when you focus too much, your brain is depleted of energy. You need to find some way to consistently feed your brain or else you're not really going to care about what you're doing either. And if you look at the global engagement statistics uh, that, are, that are generally reported by Gallup, what we find is that worldwide, only 15, one five percent of people are actually engaged with their work. And I think maybe this over-focusing is one of the reasons that this is happening. So that's the first piece. It depletes energy in the brain. The second uh, re problem with focus is that if you focus intensely, if you work with your nose to the grindstone, you're not really paying attention of what's going on around you. So Anne Wang, for example, who invented, who invented the word processor, was just focusing on the second version of the word processor, not really paying attention to the competition in the wings so that he could actually make any kind of adjustments or changes because the PC was in the wings. And had he noticed that, he might have made that adaptation to start developing something along the lines of a PC. I think the same thing can be said of Blockbuster video, of the, the video chain that was selling actual videos. They didn't notice that Netflix was happening around them. And, and as a result, they remain focused on their core business, but miss the opportunity to adapt as a result of the competition around them. So if you are just looking in front of you, you're ignoring what's to the side of you. And that's the second disadvantage. It, the, it, it, no, continue on. Sorry. So, that, so I'll, I'll list five disadvantages, but please feel free to sort of interrupt me in between if you have any questions as yeah, well. It's, Happy it's, to answer it's, it's, it's the, the it's one thing that I say to a lot of people, if, you know, if they're working constantly, I do say to them, if you're stressed or you can't figure out the answer to something, if you're working on a project, I always say to them, go outside, take a walk in the woods, you know, remove what you're doing from your mind and your idea then will appear to you or come to you when you're out in nature. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Absolutely. In fact, we, I'm happy to talk to you through some of the um, sort of mechanisms that I describe in Tinker Dabble Doodle Try yep. that that you know that will help people unfocus but you know perhaps we should go through a few more of the reasons yeah please that do focus is problematic the the third is that aside from not knowing what's going on around you you also find it more difficult to know what's coming up so if you think about robots for example who are probably going to robots will probably be taking up a lot more jobs you know there are robots that flip burgers that deliver food that even write sports articles so people are not people who are not aware of of upcoming trends because they're just focused on the here and now will miss out on these things and will not adapt in their lives to be able to accommodate what's coming up um, you know, in the future. I think the fourth uh, problem with focus is that when you focus, it's great for just you know, checking off lists or going through tasks. We call that simple cognition. But for complex cognition, which essentially has to do with things like creativity and innovation, we need to make associations. You know, we need to be able to think outside the box and try to think, you know, how does that relate to that? Like Gillette, for example, was a company that had a battery division and a toothbrush division, but was late to market with the battery powered toothbrush because each department worked in silos. So if we don't make associations or make the time to look for associations, then we miss them. Yeah. And yeah. finally, with regard to focus, the focus circuits in the brain will are a little bit like, you know, they pick up parts of your identity uh, that are like your LinkedIn profile, solid chunks of overt information. But the unfocused circuits in your brain, call, also called the default mode network or the DMN, actually overlaps with self-awareness. So 
for you to be fully present and self-aware, you need to take time off from those focused tasks during your day. But these are you know, the, the five reasons that I think uh, I have a problem with, with people continuously focusing. It depletes energy, it prevents you from seeing the competition, it prevents you from seeing upcoming trends, it prevents you from making associations, and you don't bring your full self to the table. And as a result of that, you end up being a much more limited version of who you are because you haven't created the time to unfocus to let your brain do the work that it's capable of doing. My wife then, she would be someone that needs to focus on everything all the time. She's a planner and, you know, she sets her to-do lists. Do you think people need to sort of be able to, okay, do their to-do list or focus fully on what they they can they, they need to achieve? And sometimes also we find that fear can creep in as well if you're not doing if you're not working enough how do you do people get around that yeah i mean firstly i think to-do lists are important and i don't think it's really about not working enough it's about working smarter rather than working harder because just working harder doesn't necessarily mean that you are being the best that you can be so you know i, w- I would say the classic examples from the literature are like steve jobs for example you know, I think he was somebody who was a great uh, proponent of taking time off so you can try to figure out what's going on. Uh, Bill Gates, the exact same thing. You know, uh, Albert Einstein, when he talked about his uh, theory of relativity, actually said that it was an, uh, that he discovered this theory by intuition, that it was like a musical experience. So even though the eventual theory ends up being focused, the the source of that of that focus is from the unfocused brain. So when it comes to doing to-do lists, I think if you just jump to the to-do list, you may come up with a bunch of things, but you may not actually make connections. So even if you were saying something like, okay, I've got to do these 10 things. I've got to pick up something from the supermarket. I've got to pick up my child from school. Yeah. I've got to, you know, like whatever that is, you may not have taken the time to say, wait a minute, I can go go to the supermarket on my way to pick up my child because you haven't taken the time to figure out how to connect different ideas. So I think that to-do lists are essential and they're important, but I do think that in general, when we are developing any kind of strategy, strategy is, so just, just to put this in perspective, approximately, I think a lot of people would argue about the exact percentage, but somewhere between 90 to 98% of brain functioning is unconscious which means that we're not aware of it. But your brain is still working under the radar. Whereas about two to maximum 10% of what you're doing is actually conscious. So a lot of organizations, for example, spend 100% of their budgets on 2% of mental functioning because they're teaching people skills and how to go from A to B. And then they wonder why people are not engaged and why people are not getting stuff done. And that's because they don't leave time for the unconscious brain to do its work. And we need to leave this time for the unconscious brain to do its work so that whatever strategies we come up with, if you think of strategies as the tree, then the unconscious is the soil and the roots of whatever strategy strategy have to be deeply in the soil and they have to be strong. Like somebody who's been looking at, who's been uh, essentially engaging their unconscious more and more will develop a very strong soil metaphorically So they'll be able to scale their strategy. They'll even be able to be more efficient and do things faster. Whereas someone who has a very logical strategy, if it's rooted in an unconscious that has not been well prepared, that strategy will be impossible to scale and it will be very difficult to actually sort of advance as efficiently as possible, even if you're going in order. So I would still say that that what we have in our brains is what I call cognitive rhythm. And I think you're being a dreamer is, I think, hugely to your advantage with a few tweaks. I would say that there are certain ways of dreaming that are really helpful, and there are other ways that are not that helpful. And so in the book, what I've actually described is ways in which the the dreaming can be helpful and what you can do to make your unfocused time more productive. You're talking about the conscious and the subconscious mind and focus. 
do you know like if you're learning to drive hit the indicators the accelerator the brake and you're focusing on all this and you can get overwhelmed while doing it but then after a while does it take like a couple of weeks where then your subconscious mind takes over this so we've all been in the situation where we've drove from point a to point b and we've then realized we we don't remember getting there is that what you're talking where you're you know you're, you're focusing on something you're learning it but then the subconscious mind over say a period of maybe two three weeks or longer understands what you what you need to do and takes over the controls yes absolutely that's another great application i think of understanding how your your sub your subconscious or unconscious mind is actually something that that works much faster the it, the transmission of information there is much much faster whereas the conscious mind is much slower so when you're learning things are a little slower it's like wait a minute i got to stop there i got to go on this off ramp I've got to make sure, you know, I, I I I take this road, I take a right or left. But once you make it automatic, then you are tapping into a different kind of intelligence. You know, it's like with sport, for example. The other day, I can't remember exactly who was playing, but it was in the Australian Open, and I was listening to the commentary, and somebody said, you know, he's playing with a top player right now, and to play with a top player, he's going to have to try really hard. And the the other person who was commentating was someone who had been a champion, and he said, actually... At this point in the game, trying is not what you want. It's trusting that you want. Because if he tries, he's going to tighten up and he's not going to play his most intelligent game. If he trusts his previous practice, then he's going to be loose enough to come up with those automatic shots that will express his higher intelligence as a result of integrating what he learned during practice. So I think that when you integrate information, after learning it consciously, it, it allows you to process information, information much faster, like when you're driving. And in sport, it allows you to access a deeper, more effective, more efficient intelligence so that you can win the game. Yeah, I can understand that. We've been uh, practicing uh, martial arts myself, which is Wing Chun. And Wing Chun actually follows the other person's uh, uh, the other person's muscles so you know you make contact with them and you're following them around and that takes years of practice before you actually then can use the art in in sport a psychologist over here in ireland called richard burke he calls the mind the child and the elephant and what he's basically saying is that the child the conscious mind is sitting on top of an elephant which is the subconscious mind and there's a fight between them all the time where the subconscious mind is doing everything where the child is trying to control everything as well. And I thought that was a great analogy that he used for the conscious and the unconscious mind. It really is, because I think so much of the time we we relegate most of what we're doing to the conscious mind. You know, like a lot of people I work with sometimes will say, why are you doing so many different things? I wish you would just focus on one thing. Well, I've done a lot of things with a lot of depth over time. And what I'm finding is that my work in music is informing my work in science. I'm finding that my work in technology is being informed by my work in music. And, and I'm not the first person in the world to think that. I think that's what Einstein was referring to when he said that he owes the discovery of the theory of relativity to his musical background. I think most people who have another interest will know that if they just follow the child, they're not gonna get an outcome that has a lot of depth. Whereas if they consider both the child and the elephant, and they figure out how to switch effectively between the two. It's what I call cognitive rhythm. You know, when they're able to switch effectively between the two, that's when you use your brain in the most effective way possible. How do people train themselves or how do you teach people to use their subconscious mind or train their subconscious mind out of either negative thoughts and to a more happy, positive thoughts? Sure. Well, look, so there, there are a lot of different ways. I would say what I usually do is I start with a, a few very practical, simple, easy to use to, you know, tools and techniques. And then the discussion becomes a little bit more abstract and deeper. But to start out a little bit more superficially, I would say that the, the basis of everything that I teach people within organizations is that the brain can change. So businesses are made up of people and people have brains. And the brain can change. In fact, if you change your brain, studies have shown that changing your mindset uh, can increase your, your efficacy 
and is, is, the, is the best use of, of managerial time is, is trying to change people's mindsets uh, because that improves the outcomes 4.4 times. So the basis of what I teach is that your brain can change and you can change it in a number of ways. And the first piece that I teach people is self-talk. So if you ask, well, how do you teach? Well, what does self-talk mean? What self-talk means is that there are very particular ways when you talk to yourself, either out loud or in your head, that can actually change your brain. And studies have shown, especially with cognitive therapy, studies have shown that self-talk can be particularly um, sort of helpful. So here are some principles, for example, that I think uh, people would, would, would potentially like to uh, reflect on. Okay. Uh, the, the first is uh, when you are forming a goal in your life, rather than saying, do not do that, like do not lose your temper at the board meeting or do not spend money, or what you should do is frame the goal in the positive. Because when you frame a goal in the positive, if you say, you know, spend spend less money or, or be judicious about how you're spending the money, or if you say, I want to maintain my calm at the board meeting, it's much more effective because Daniel Wegner, who's a researcher at Harvard in psychology who actually passed away recently, but he has this amazing body of research that shows that under stress, your brain effectively does not hear the word no. It will just, it, there's too much going on under stress for it to inhibit what you're asking it to inhibit. And as a result, it does exactly the opposite of what you want it to do. And this has been shown in a number of different instances. So the classic example is you're at a party, you're holding two glasses of wine, and just as you're walking past the white couch, you say, do not drop the wine. Why is it that the moment yeah. you say, do not drop the wine, the wine's all over the couch? And and that's because you said do not drop the wine and your brain under situations of stress doesn't even hear that. You know, they've also shown this in soccer players as well. So with soccer players, if they're scoring penalties, if they if you put eye tracking devices on their eyes and if they say do not kick the ball to the right, the eye goes to the right immediately. So, you know, technique number one for self-talk is frame your goals in the positive because that's more helpful. Secondly, with regard to feeling more positive, call out your emotions as they are. I think forcing yourself to be positive when you're in a bad mood is not necessarily the best thing to do. I, I think to a certain extent, you have to take a step back and observe your thoughts rather than be sort of ruled by them. Uh, but calling out your emotions, saying, you know what, I'm feeling really anxious now or I'm feeling upset now. The moment you name the emotion, we call this affect labeling. It decreases activation in the brain's anxiety processor. And as a result of this, you feel much calmer. And then the third tip that I would, I would give people to feel better and feel more confident is when you are speaking to yourself, like, you know, let's say Serena Williams, the tennis player, for example, when she goes back to the baseline, rather than saying, I'm going to crush this, where you're trying to psych yourself up, Ethan Cross and his colleagues have found that it's much more effective if you say, call yourself by name. If you were Serena, you would say, Serena, you're gonna crush this. And you do this in the second person. And by speaking to yourself as if you're another person, it actually increases your confidence and decreases your stress. So the first technique that I would teach people with regard to improving their confidence is to engage in self-talk and remember those rules. So I'll stop there. See if you have any questions, and if not, I, I can go on to. A, yeah, a no, I, I, I'm 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 all ears listening to you. One of the things that it just I I totally understand where you're saying don't do, and it's it's something it's it's funny with my own children. You'd say to one of them, "Be careful with that ball that you don't." hurt kick your little sister with it, and suddenly they kick the ball, and where does the ball end up? Hit, hitting the little sister it was, oh, I didn't mean it I didn't mean it so yes I can totally relate to that the self talk yes I get it and I, I think that with ourselves and myself personally is I do do the self talk if I am making a call or I'm, I'm going into a meeting I do come on Joe you can do it it builds my self confidence up as well and there's one thing that I liked one thing that I do as well which um, maybe you, you may be able to touch off is part of my self talk as well and part of me moving through my day is meditation do you teach people or do you even tap into the likes of meditation as well to help people move forward yes 
So I, I, I would say, so I myself practice transcendental meditation, which I find really helpful. Um, but I think if we had to base it on the research data, probably the, the research backed up form of meditation that has the most data backing it up is what we call mindfulness meditation. And so that brings me to the second set of strategies for decreasing anxiety and becoming more positive. It's defined by the mnemonic. It's a reframing technique that's based in a lot of brain research that shows that you can shift brain blood flow from the anxiety center back to the thinking brain when you're thinking about how to manage this anxiety. And so I ask people when they're feeling freaked out by something or they're feeling not confident about something and they want to address this anxiety, think of the mnemonic circa where, and, and I'll ask people, you know, take out a piece of paper and, and a pen and, and write this down, <coughs> excuse me, where the first C stands for chunking. And what that means is if you're presented with a big problem, like you've got to get this report done in three weeks, you chunk it down and say, hey, what can I do in the next three days? What, what can I do? The moment you start breaking it down for your brain, your brain is not that overwhelmed. So it actually works much better. The I stands for ignore mental chatter. And that relates to the meditation that you were talking about, where if you practice, I think ideally 20 minutes twice a day, but if you don't like to do that, then maybe start with five minutes where whatever mental chatter is going on, you close your eyes, you place your attention on your breath. And as you place your attention on your breath, you'll notice your mind's just chattering. You know, what about that? What am I going to do at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock? And you just keep your attention like a flashlight on your breath as you breathe in and out. And whatever chattering is going on, you just let it go on. And what studies show is if you practice this, and you know sometimes your mind goes back to the chatter, but you gently bring it back to your breath. If you practice this, uh, what the studies show is that it decreases activation of the uh, anxiety center in the brain, yeah. and it can also improve potentially yeah. your longevity as well. So mindfulness meditation, I think, is especially helpful. And if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, oh, man, I hate meditation. Like, I don't want to be sitting still. Realize that there are other forms of meditation as well. There are walking forms of meditation. There's a website called Headspace where you can meditate by playing these games. So there are a lot of different ways in which you can activate these circuits in similar ways. The R in the mnemonic stands for reality check. And what this means is this too shall pass. Just telling your brain this too shall pass really helps it because a lot of times when you open up an email and you're irritated with it, or if you get some kind of anxiety provoking task to do, we often think it's gonna last forever. But if you say this too shall pass, you actually know that it's gonna pass and so you're able to put that aside. Um, then the C, the next C in Circa is for control check. And control check essentially means that we try to control a lot of things, right? We try to control the stock market. We try to control who's president. We try to control what the weather is. A lot of stuff we try to control is just pointless trying to control it unless we're gonna do something about it. Yeah. So yeah. ask yourself, is there something I'm trying to control or something that's bugging me that I should just let go? And that's what that control check is. And then attention shift is simply taking your attentional flashlight and taking it away from the problem onto the solution. So rather than saying, I need to make $100,000, how am I gonna make it? You say, let me think about people who are in my position, who don't have a great likelihood of doing this, how those people actually achieve that. And that way you're asking about solution-oriented thinking, and you're, and you're already giving your brain the message that it, you may not know how to actually make that money, but by giving your brain that message, you're saying it's possible, let's try to figure this out. So the mnemonic circa incorporates the idea of meditation, and I think meditation is especially helpful. I think the one thing I would say about that is that the, my book, Tinker Dabble Little Try, is it advocates both meditation, because meditation, even though it's focused on your breath initially, there is a more unfocused period afterwards. But the second thing is that studies have shown that mindfulness meditation is better for uh, analytical problem solving. Whereas one of the things that I prescribe is mind wandering or positive constructive daydreaming is actually better for creative problem solving. So I think once again, by incorporating both focused and unfocused techniques into your day, you will be able to harness your brain for whatever problem you have at hand. 
We're just going to take a short break. Are you looking to boost your performance? Motivate your sales team? Have an all-round structure to your marketing? Get in touch with myself at Breakthrough Brands or contact me at joe at jdc.ie. I have notes here and you're answering everything before I get to it. So I'm ticking them off as we go through. <laughs> um, one thing I want to ask you about, frequency, different frequencies for the brain. And do you know where we might find uh, be- be- is it beta testing or um, you'll find on YouTube that someone might say, listen to this frequency, that it'll help your mind or whatever. Do you, do you think listening to different frequencies have a beneficial to the mind? is my um, question what i'm trying to get to yes in fact so in your brain there are slow waves and there are fast waves and so both of these are important and sometimes when you want to go into a state of of deeper relaxation you want to actually engage these slower waves and so things like meditation and like some of the exercises that we could talk about can actually change your brain frequency and you know if you just think about what we're talking about right at some level we all have brains and we have neurons, which are like you know pieces of string that are crossed or like wire that are crossed all over. And these, this wire transmits energy. And so if you're always in a state of high energy transmission, you're going to exhaust the brain because your brain sometimes needs these lower frequencies, this kind of what I call being in purring mode, so that while it's got this low level purr, it actually performs a completely different set of functions. It Rather than just extracting information like the focus brain might do with, with the higher frequencies, in the lower frequencies, that is when the brain can make connections across the brain and come up with creative ideas and find these puzzle pieces that are hiding outside of the realm of focus. And the moment you can call these puzzle pieces to the fore, you can actually then start to solve problems creatively much more effectively. Brilliant. I, I, we're coming to the end of the show. Um, I, I, I could listen to you talking for hours, and that's why I got the book, and the book is just mind-blowing. Can I ask you just, just three questions that I ask everyone before we get to the end? And, and one is, what's the best business advice that you've ever received to help you on your way? I think the best business advice I ever received was that no matter what I read, I should read that to reflect on it and not just follow it automatically. Because I think that what most people do is they try to copy other people's business models, not realizing that it's fine to have a framework, but your own intelligence is really much more important than copying somebody else's framework. And and what I found is the more I do things on my own terms, while I still read a ton of advice and I still incorporate that, I don't just follow it rote. I actually try to integrate it and I try to lead with my own intelligence. So for me, that was just so important because had I followed other people's advice, I don't think I would have been at the point that I'm at right now where I can integrate the technology with the music and with the science and with the business because a lot of people along the way said choose one or the other thing. And had I just listened to that, I would have actually missed out on the kinds of connections that my intuition was telling me I would enjoy more. And that's the intuition. It's very powerful, isn't it? Listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. I I, nor, I normally ask pe- people to recommend a book um, for them to, to read for that you would suggest for people to read. And I usually ask them to pick a book that isn't a book that they wrote or n- themselves. Would you like to, I would st- I would actually tell people to get your book, Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try. It's absolutely amazing. But what other book would you recommend for someone to pick up? You know, I, in general, so in general, I read a lot more uh, contemporary research. So research that's just come out rather than books. Because a lot of times when you read a book, the book has already been written a year and a half, two ago. And a lot of what I have to do is connect things with the most recent research. So I don't read business books per se, but what I do know is that when I read books that I truly enjoy, even when they're not business related, they give me all kinds of ideas about business as well. So, you know, for example, I recently took up D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love, which sounds a little bit psychotic. It's like, well, you know, that's a fictional story. What's it going to tell you about business? Except that what that book did was it reconnected me with 
a sense of sincerity and authenticity and ingenuity that I felt when I first read that book. And that actually helped me reformulate some business strategies in a completely different way. So I think the short answer is that I don't typically read business books, but I do read a lot of books, both fiction and nonfiction, and a lot of business papers. And I think that by, by reading those papers, it, it sort of it keeps me on my toes so that I can be up to date with the most recent research. It, it's like uh, one of our previous guests, Andy Paul, uh, said, read Shakespeare, Macbeth. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Macbeth is an amazing one to read because you know, there's so many things about decision-making processes, you know, in that scene where Macbeth says something like, and I'm not fully quoting, something like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm in doubt because to go forward, to go back would be as tedious as to go forward. And so he just moves forward into his life of tragedy. It's one of the decision-making traps we all make, right? With the sunk cost trap, when we, when we, when we are investing in something and we realize it's not working out, rather than pulling back, we keep on investing in it because we feel like we've already started. But I think a book like Macbeth can activate that thought in an indirect way. So, yeah, I think whatever you like to read is is great. I mean, I get a lot from even some ridiculous things. I mean, I have, you know, I, you can get a lot from soap operas. You can get a lot from romance novels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it really is about being yourself. You know, Warren Bennis, who I think of as the father of leadership studies, said that leadership is synonymous with becoming yourself. It is precisely that easy and also that difficult. And really what he's saying is that in a dark abyss of constant volatility and uncertainty, in terms of your compass, the best compass to follow is your internal compass. And the more you can prepare that internal compass with stuff that you love, and stuff that you respect, the more likely it is that you will be able to navigate your way through the most difficult storm. I think most people are fearful of being themselves. One reason, because I think they, people think that they're a fraud, and two is the fear of rejection. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, the, the whole thing about being oneself at the deepest level, and this is what I meant about some of the deeper conversations, is that the self is constantly evolving, right? And we're full of paradoxes. Like the, the whole idea about being human, like people think they've got to have one way and like one thing and only do one thing. And if they don't do that, then somehow, you know, they're, 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 they're a fraud because they're, they're not saying what they truly want. I think it's okay to say you don't know. I mean, how are you going to explore new vistas if you know? Someone who knows doesn't have any reason to explore. So a lot of times I will say things that sound like contradictions and often are. And I'll, I'll just put it on the table and say, yeah, I guess this is the contradiction. Like, I think focus is important, but I think unfocus is important as well. I think it's, as, know, I, it's, I think it's as important to say no as well. Absolutely. I think um, you know, there's a great video, if you uh, Google it online, Lady Gaga talking about her life at a moment of crisis. And she said she was actually thinking about giving up her career in singing because she started to become this person she couldn't even recognize. She, you know, a person who was selling perfumes, a person who was just doing stuff for money. And she said, you know, I, I lost my core. And then I started to say no. And she said, when I started to say no, that's when I'd go home in the evening and I would look at myself in the mirror and I would say, you, I can sleep with any time because you are authentic and you're real. And you're saying no because you don't want to do stuff that you don't like. And I think to every person out there, there's at least one thing in your life right now that you're doing that you can say no to. Yeah, I, I think there's a romance in everything as well. Let's look at people that are that are employed um, and, you know, they have this romance of setting up their own business or they have the romance of being an entrepreneur and they they can't because they're trapped in a mortgage or they're trapped in, in bills with family as well. And, you know, we, I hear a lot of people going, oh, follow your dreams, do what you want and all, but a lot of people can't because they because of the situation that they're in. What what sort of advice would you give those people if and if if you could give them advice? I think I would say first of all recognize that if you are operating at the same level that you're operating now, then probably what you're saying is correct. If, because what you actually need in that circumstance is some kind of creative way to extract yourself from that cage. And so in the book, I actually talk about possibility thinking, which is a lot like the growth mindset which Carol Dweck studied, um, which essentially has been proven. It's been proven people will actually advance faster at work. They will be promoted more. 
they have much better outcomes educationally. Um, you know, poorer kids do poorly at school. The moment they have the growth mindset, they do as well as any other kid. I mean, this possibility mindset is really important. And I think the question I would have for someone who says, I've got a mortgage to pay and I can't just follow my dreams because I've got to live a practical life. I would say, do you think there's any person in the world who has had a mortgage to pay and who has felt constricted in the way that you feel constricted, who has actually been able to extend their lives closer to their dreams? And if you say there's zero people, then we'd understand that. But I think we all know that there's always the exception that you can emulate. And possibility thinking, which is self-talk to your brain, that something is possible, can actually help you think about what would someone who has a family and who has a mortgage do if they wanted to increase their degree of freedom? And I think by asking yourself what this exception does, just by knowing that it's possible, you know, studies have shown this will increase your dopamine, make your brain feel more jazzed. It will come up with ways that you ordinarily could not see. And you will often find that, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with possibility thinking, I think you know, I, the, the thought that comes to mind is a quote by Muhammad Ali, who said, it's not the mountain in front of you that's the problem. It's the pebble in your shoe. Yeah. And, and I think that we have to all ask ourselves, is it really my life circumstance or am I not prepared to give myself that extra boost with a sense of belief? Just, and I know it's not easy, but I would encourage anyone in that position to try to emulate the exception. There's three things that come to mind. One is, you know, you hear people saying fear of failure and then there could be fear of success. But I think the biggest problem with a lot of people is procrastination. Yeah, I mean, so I think all three of those are, are, are really, are really important. I think procrastination is more about self-doubt. And I think people doubt themselves because they feel like they don't know the way forward, whereas I think not knowing the way forward is a pretty sensible state of mind to be in. You know, Steve Jobs himself said that the thing he most relied on in his life was the fact that you cannot join the dots looking backwards, the, looking going forward, but you can join it looking backwards. And he said, you have to follow something. And he called it in his words, something like gut, karma, destiny, whatever. There is an intuitive capability that we are all endowed with that we need to follow. And doubt comes about when you turn to to look at the child rather than the elephant, and when you try to figure things out consciously, nobody who has a family and a mortgage and financial obligations is going to be able to figure things out consciously. You've got to figure out a way to release your unconscious brain. And that, I think, will take you out of procrastination mode and allow you to see possibilities where you haven't seen possibilities previously. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's like for myself, I follow my gut and it, it's the intuition that, you know, you get that, do that now and it's three o'clock in the morning and you jump up and write it, write it down because if you don't write it down at three o'clock in the morning, when I wake up in the morning, I forgot it. So uh, yeah, it is allowing that subconscious mind to, to move forward. Tell yeah. me this, where can people find you? Where can they buy your book? Where can they log into any of your training courses? Give us all your details, please. Thank you. Yeah, so you can you can find me at drsrinipillay.com. It's D-R-S-R-I-N-I dot com. Um, so it's, it's drsrinipillay.com. So after the I, it's a P-I-L-L-A-Y. Uh, if it's a business, it's nbgcorporate.com. So it's N as in Nancy, B as in boy, G as in girl, and then the word corporate, all one word, dot com. And I'm on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, would love to interact with people and frequently putting out writings. Um, and I always say to people, you know, I both believe and don't believe what I say because I feel like the nature of research <laughs> is that we're constantly reinventing what the truth is. So I think that what I provide to people is framework. And what I ask of them is to meet those, those frameworks with their own ingenuity. Uh, and so by going to any of those sites, I think uh, it'll be evident um, that, that that's the way in which I would recommend that you proceed in life. Serene, what's the future for you? I don't know. Um, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the technology that we're developing, and I'm pretty excited about uh, the musical that I'm writing, because the music is actually um, sort of incorporating a lot of the principles from the books that I've written so I think the immediate future is going to be the development of technology um, related to business practices, helping businesses 
um, sort of you know implement this. Also helping people in life who are, you know entre- want to be entrepreneurs implement these practices. And I think with the musical, I want to be able to communicate what a beautiful, powerful force the brain is without preaching about it or feeling like I have to talk scientifically about it. I actually believe that uh, if I can have, if I can contribute to conscious awareness about the brain, the way that people have contributed to people talking about exercise and diet, um, I will feel pretty pleased if we can, if we can basically put the brain on the runway rather than being behind the podium. Yeah. You know, I've been saying to people, how come the body gets a runway, but the brain gets a boring podium? I think the, the brain needs a runway of its own. And um, hopefully uh, people will be able to resonate with that by recognizing that that is one of the most powerful forces that we carry along with us. I think it's changing. I think people are starting to become more self-aware and delving in to the brain and the, the conscious and the subconscious mind. Well, I are, think so too. Yeah. We're going to play out with a song. We'd like you to pick it. Well, I was thinking, I just composed a song that uh, that was related to my book, Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try. That's perfect. We'd love that, actually. Thank, Thank you for you. coming on the show. It's been sure. a pleasure. Um, I could honestly listen to you for hours. Thank you so much for having me on the show and for spreading the word. Um, I really appreciate that as well. When I feel down and frustrated And the world makes me feel jaded Cause I can't ever feel sated And the end is never near When I'm caught up in distractions And I'm stuck in chain reactions Cause I feel no satisfaction And I'm afraid that I am lost I say to my mama What should I not do? I say to my mama What should I not do? Hey! And the fear has not abated I might never ever make it And my world comes tumbling down When I hunker down and focus And I know that it feels bogus I just feel so weird and hopeless If I can't get anything done I say to my mama What should I now do? I say to my mama What should I now do? And she said to me This show was sponsored by Harris Myers, your sales and marketing agency, helping you develop a better sales and marketing pipeline.